What is up, YouTube? Welcome back to the Blockware Intelligence YouTube channel. My name is Blake Davis, and we are back for episode six of Crypto Equity Investing 101. This episode is going to be, I think, a long one, so strap in, but we're going to talk about uh, relative strength, uh, strategies to identify relative strength, and looking at basing patterns, because those two uh, topics are you know, deeply intertwined with each other. Um, but before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that um, none of the information in this series is investment advice. I'm not a certified financial advisor, and nobody should, should pursue any investment strategy without conducting proper due diligence. So to begin, um, let's talk about relative strength. What is relative strength? Well, it's, it's exactly as the name sounds, right? It's the idea of being able to identify periods or indications of strength in a particular stock relative to other stocks in the market, other stocks in their industry group, or most commonly looking at the stock market indexes like the S&P and the NASDAQ. So we could talk a little bit about why identifying uh, relative strength or RS is so important. Um, and it, it isn't anything new or anything that you know we've just made up. This is um, how traders have been able to outperform the market for you know the last hundred years, right? I study the work of Jesse Livermore a lot, who's a trader in the 1910s and 20s and 30s, um, and he was identifying relative strength, and he wasn't doing it the same way that we're doing it now. Um, you know, he wasn't using charts. You know, he didn't have a you know a laptop and a trading view account, um, but he was still able to study price action and identify the strongest stocks in the market. And this is important because you know history's biggest winners, right? The the biggest stocks in in um, you know in the history of the market. You know, talk about Cisco in the '90s or you know Microsoft in the '80s and '90s. You know, whatever. Um, these stocks all showed these signs of RS. Um, you know, just prior to emerging from these sound basing patterns, which uh, we're going to talk about next. Um, but RS is just a signal that that stock has something special going on, right? It, it, it it's outperforming the pack. It's outperforming the index. So being able to identify RS allows us to be in a position to be in these potentially uh, strongest stocks uh, in the market. So um, I, I think identifying and you know spotting RS is is pretty misunderstood um, or it's ignored. Um, but it, it it's really important. Uh, it's a really important principle of investment and trading. Because like I mentioned, we, we want signals that we're in the strongest stocks that we can be, right? Why would you not want to put your hard-earned money in the name with the greatest likelihood of success? And this kind of goes against some of the maybe value investment or um, uh, other types of investment strategy where you want to buy stocks that are undervalued or cheap. Um, that's not what this is. A lot of times we're looking to buy stocks that are making new highs, high, stocks that might look expensive to some people. Um, there's that, you know, age old investing quote, you know, buy low, sell high. And that's not what we're going to do here. We're looking to buy stocks that are high and sell them higher. Um, and that gives us the greatest likelihood of success. So we're looking for stocks um, that are emerging from sound bases, showing high RS, and then find a low risk entry point uh, with the highest maximum reward. So now we can talk a little bit about uh, basing patterns or price patterns, which uh, I'm sure you've probably heard of. But what these what these do is they combine these RS signals um, to give us this visual of a you know supply and demand market psychology and RS uh, you know playing out in real time, which provide us with these pricing patterns, which allow us to find buy points that have the highest maximum reward with the least amount of risk. So it's this risk to reward ratio, um, sort of this risk management that I discussed in episode four. We're kind of now combining all of these concepts that we've discussed over the last five episodes into these basing patterns. Um, and the, these patterns work because human psychology doesn't change over time. We can study history's biggest winners um, and use those same repeated, um, easily identifiable identifiable patterns um, because human nature hasn't changed and human psychology hasn't changed. Um, and I, I talked a little bit about this in episode one is, you know, the, the biggest argument is, oh, you know, the majority of uh, market volume comes from algorithms. Um, but as I discussed, these algorithms are you know, built by humans and they're looking for criteria that a, you know, a human who developed this algorithm is looking for. So in a sense, um, it doesn't really matter 
it's it's still uh, playing off these uh, indications of human psychology and human nature. Um, but identifying basing patterns is going to essentially come down to your experience in the market and your work ethic in a sense. So it's this idea that not all bases are created equally. When you first start to learn about patterns and you start to look for them in the market, you're going to find them everywhere. I mean, you can go you can go on a five minute chart and find a new pattern every hour, um, but not all of them are going to play out exactly as you are hoping. Um, and that just comes down to experience and looking at charts. Um, and then slowly over time, as you flip through hundreds and thousands of charts, you eventually start to understand some of the signals that say, hey, maybe this pattern's um, more likely to succeed than some others. Maybe this pattern's faulty. Chances are it's not going to work out. It's going to fail. It just comes down to experience. So I think, you know, when I first started trading, it just was, I would spend time every day just flipping through charts, you know, as, as many charts as I could do for that day, hundreds of charts a day, um, just starting to train your eye to eventually you get to the point over the course of, you know, months and years that you don't need to, you know, look back at, you know, pattern guides and, and, and whatnot. You, you just, your brain automatically um, connects those dots and you don't even have to really think about what you're looking like, what you're looking at. You just automatically uh, can identify those signs of strength, signs of weakness um, and those kinds of things. But it, yeah, it just comes down to experience and how hard you want to work at it. There's, there's a learning curve to everything and the stock market has a huge learning curve. Trading has a huge learning curve. Um, but you can shorten that learning curve based off of how hard you work at it. So, um, you know, Will O'Neill, Bill O'Neill has this quote where he says, um, you know, you don't just dabble in stocks. Um, if, if you want to vastly outperform the market and then you want to, tr if you want to trade uh, profitably, you have to work at it. it. It's hard to get really good at something if you're not really spending a whole lot of time practicing it. So even if you're not trading with any money, just you know, watching the market every day can help to train your eye. So now we can go a little bit into some of these patterns, and I'm not going to discuss every pattern out there. There's there's dozens of patterns. It would take me hours and hours to talk about all of them, um, and I don't use all of them. I, you know, I I think it's best to focus on a few patterns uh, that you understand deeply, uh, rather than you know trying to play every single strategy out there. But I'll talk about what uh, I believe is the most common. Uh, pattern out there, and that's called the cup with handle. Um, and there's there's some general criteria with the cup and handle that are applicable to a lot of other patterns as well. Uh, for these, you know, longer uh, patterns that form through market corrections and bear markets. The first of which is the prior uptrend. So we're looking to um, identify a pattern that is following a prior uptrend. Um, I think the criteria that Bill O'Neill used is about 30% prior uptrend, um, but something in that range, something significant. And then we're looking for a minimum of a seven to eight week base. So if you have these really short bases, um, the, the likelihood of a massive price move after after um, you know a, a breakout of that base is is significantly lower. So we're looking for a you know relatively long and deep base. Um, and with the cup and handle. The cup is that you know uh, rounded, uh, almost semicircle shape uh, that you see that takes place over the majority of the base. And for that, uh, for that cup, we're looking for a round and symmetrical cup. We're not looking for a V. So seeing this, a, a long, curved, uh, round uh, cup gives us the greatest likelihood of that price pattern, um, you know, working in a breakout to the upside. And ideally, you would like to see that cup from that peak. So if you see my example there on the left hand side, um, that, you know, that previous peak from that prior uptrend um, down to the bottom of the cup, you would like to see it somewhere in that 12 to 30% range. So, uh, you know, a cup can be deeper than that, right? You'll often see cups that are 50 or 60% deep, um, but the likelihood of them succeed, succeeding is slightly less than a cup that's in that 12 to 30% range. And then if you see a cup that's less than 12%, um, you know, generally, if it's less than 12%, it's probably not a seven to eight week base. Um, but it's also, you know, you want to see a, a true shakeout. And we're going to talk about shakeouts a lot today because it's an important aspect of most price patterns. But you want to see a, a, a truly deep base, um, you know, with some level of, you know, deep selling capitulation, if you will. Um, so 12 to 30%, I think is a good uh, ballpark for the depth of the cup. 
And then on the right hand side, you want to see a handle. So you can't see cups without handles. Um, they're a little more rare. It's a little more rare to see them succeed because we want to see this shakeout that comes in the form of a handle. So ideally, it's a it's a shallow handle on light volume. So um, you know you'd want to see them form in the upper half of the cup. Um, and normally the handle, or ideally I should say, the handle will start prior to that or below that previous all-time high um, on the left-hand side, or previous high. It doesn't have to be all-time high. Previous high on the left-hand side there. Um, so we want to see a, a relatively shallow handle, um, you know, anywhere from maybe 5 to 10% deep or less, um, and you want to see it on light volume. So we, what we don't want to see is a, a cup form and then a handle start, and you see you know big red volume, which is institutions unloading positions. Um, that's not what you want. You want to see a, a shallow handle on light volume, uh, which causes this shakeout. So it, it, you know it'll make traders um, you know worried, fearful that this this price pattern is going to fail. It'll it'll cause them to sell their positions, which is this shakeout, which adds uh, dry powder or you know fuel for that move to the upside. So when that handle uh, you know, reverses and starts to move to the upside, um, you'll have all this, um, you know, fuel for that move higher. You know, these people will try to get back in. Oh God, I messed up. I shouldn't have sold that. Uh, I'm going to buy it back. And that kind of adds, um, you know, this dry powder, this fuel for the move to the upside. And I noted here that we want to see that handle hold the 10 day EMA. That's not necessarily like a set in stone criteria of a cup and handle. I just think that's a good, you know, general benchmark um, to see the handle holding a key moving average. Um, it could be 21 EMA, something in there, a shorter term moving average. But um, generally speaking, it's just, you know, a, a shallow pullback on light volume. Um, and then you have that pivot point uh, that I noted in that example as well, that uh, horizontal dotted line. And that's the um, buy point for a cup and handle. That's That provides us with the strongest risk to reward because we want to wait for the handle to prove itself that it's not going to fail and, and the cup of handle is not going to fail. Uh, so we want to see that handle turn around, over, uh, get over that um, you know previous handle high, um, and that's our safest buy point. So now um, let's flip over to trading view here and look at a real world example of a cup with handle. And here we're looking at McDonald's uh, in the late 90s. Um, and what you could see is a cup with handle playing out. And this is longer than seven or eight weeks, right? This is a you know three or four month uh, cup with handle here. Um, but you can kind of see this uh, identifiable pattern here. So you have this uh, relatively deep uh, and symmetrical uh, base here with this two to three week uh, handle. Um, it's on relatively light volume. You can see volume kind of dries up uh, towards the bottom of the handle. And then you you know, end up breaking out to the upside uh, over this high here, which would have been your buy point. Um, and this kind of illustrates you know, in real life how these supply and demand uh, relationships play out uh, and how they look on a stock chart. So what you see is, you know, you have selling um, and then, you know, eventually you reach some sort of support zone uh, where prices can turn around um, and it takes time. So you see this, uh, you know, rounded base. It's not it's not a, necessarily a V. Um, and then, you know, prices as they move towards all time highs, they run into selling beforehand. But that selling isn't too aggressive. So you have, um, you know, a short pullback. It's on relatively lighter volume. Um, that creates that shakeout. And as you can see, it's in the upper half of this uh, cup here. And um, of course, we have a breakout. And this is a weekly chart. So I think uh, using a weekly chart can make it a little easier to filter out some of the, you know, daily noise. Um, and for a, you know, a sound cup with handle, we're looking for a multi-week base. So using weekly charts uh, can be extremely helpful. Um, so yeah, this is just one example of a cup with handle um, using McDonald's. And you can see we kind of came back in here and we retested that pivot point, um, which is a very common uh, thing that we'll see uh, with um, you know basing patterns is you'll have a retest of that pivot point. Um, and that can also provide a secondary entry. It can add a place to um, you know buy more of a position. Or if you miss the breakout, uh, you can buy that retest of the pivot point but you want to see that retest hold. And then as you can see, McDonald's goes on this, um, you know, multi-month uh, run here.
So the second most common base uh, that you'll see out there is called the double bottom. Uh, and you've probably heard of this one. A lot of people are talking about it now because uh, the market indexes uh, today look like they could be forming a double bottom. Um, but the issue is a lot of people miss the most important characteristic of the double bottom. And that's the undercut of the first low. So a, a true double bottom, you know, a, a pure double bottom, if you will, isn't a W. It's not a retest of the same support zone. You would ideally see an undercut of that first low. And that creates the shakeout. Um, that creates, you know, adds the, the dry powder, adds the fuel uh, for the move upwards. So you would ideally like to see an undercut of that first low, um, as I'll show you in an uh, example up next. Um, and then you have this pivot point, which would be at the, um, you know, that middle high um, that, you know, that, um, that creates the second leg down. Um, that would be your pivot point. That would be the safest place. Uh, from a risk reward perspective um, in order to buy through a double bottom. So here is an example of a double bottom using Apple. Uh, once again, this is a weekly chart um, here in 2006. So as you can see, we created this double bottom uh, base here over the course of several months. Um, and you could see this, you know, this characteristic of the undercut. So, you know, if this was, um, you know, your, your, your first low, you want to see an undercut of that low, uh, which creates that shakeout. Um, and once again, we, we, you want to see a shakeout, but you don't want to see a high volume shakeout. So what you can see here is uh, with Apple, as it undercut that low, it had a, you know, a pretty uh, light volume uh, shakeout. So that was you know people being shook out, but people not capitulating. Uh, that's not institutional um, you know, unloading. That's just uh, a shakeout. So then, um, as you see, you know, this would be your pivot point uh, through here. And, you know, this is a weekly chart. So this was, you know, this, this move higher was over the course of, um, you know, a few months. So there would have been other entries in here um, that you probably could have uh, what we'd call like a cheat entry, an early entry. Um, but the true, priv the true pivot point would be, um, you know, above this high here. Um, and then obviously, you know, Apple went on this, this massive run afterwards. Um, you know, this is, you know, almost a retest over here of that pivot point. Um, but ideally, you know, this is the highest, uh, risk to reward area to be buying. You were waiting for confirmation, um, and a, you know, being able to retake this, uh, high right here is, you know, the ultimate sign of confirmation for the double bottom base. So next we have the volatility contraction pattern, uh, the VCP, uh, which is similar to a wedge. Um, and they're not exactly the same, um, but for simplicity's sake, um, you know, they're similar enough that I'm just going to group them together. Um, and the VCP is popularized by um, very successful trader Mark Minervini. Um, and basically what it shows is, um, you know, this increased battle between buyers and sellers. So you want to see volatility contracting, you know, volatility decreasing. Um, if you don't know what volatility is, that's essentially the um, aggressiveness in which price is moving. So when you have price exploding to the upside or you know falling very quickly, that would be highly volatile. So what we want to see uh, in this sort of pattern is a uh, contraction of volatility, a decreased volatility as as price tightens in this range. And you know, like I mentioned, this signifies an increased battle between buyers and sellers. So if you remember. I believe it was episode two when I was talking about candlesticks, and you can think about them like a game of tug of war, um, you know, where buyers are trying to pull prices higher and sellers are trying to drag them lower. Um, a volatility contraction, a you know, a really tight price action, um, signifies that that battle between buyers and sellers is getting very intense. Um, and eventually, uh, when someone takes the lead, so either price breaks up above that resistance level or price breaks down below that support level or that uh, trend line, uh, you'll see an explosion of volatility in that direction. So one example that I've used in the newsletter before is thinking about a stock like a can of Coke or soda, whatever, um, and you know volatility. So this choppy, uh, almost sideways price action is shaking up that can of soda, and it builds up all this pressure inside, right? 
Um, and then when that stock uh, is able to break above the, let's call it, you know, if that stock's going to break out to the upside and it's going to break above that resistance level, you're opening up that can that's built up all that pressure, right? The price action is so tight. There's all this pressure. Um, and then finally you break above that resistance level and the sellers sort of back off and the buyers, uh, you know, pile into this stock, which creates that explosive volatility and price action uh, to the upside. So for the VCP, um, kind of the key signal that differentiates these patterns is the number of contractions that are formed. Um, so the number of, you know, waves. Um, and then you also want to see these waves um, have, you know, contracting volatility. So you want to see less of a pullback with each wave um, until you have, you know, very tight price action, um, which is... Uh, like what we saw with Bitcoin this week, it wasn't a VCP, but we saw uh, volatility compressed. Um, you know, Bitcoin was stuck between a support level and the 10 EMA until, you know, price action is so tight, there's there's nowhere it can go. So it's either going to, you know, break lower or explode higher. Um, and that's sort of the, um, you know, backbone of this sort of pattern. So here's an example of a VCP a volatility contraction pattern using Tesla from late 2019. Um, and this isn't, you know, a perfect example. Um, you know, nothing, there, there, there never is. Um, but what you can see here is, is that same principle of volatility contracting. So you see this, um, you know, there's this previous downtrend a little bit, but um, what you have is, you know, basically these three waves of, um, you know, volatility contraction. So, you know, you have this pretty deep, uh, almost like a cup shape here. Um, but eventually, you know, prices get back higher to where, you know, sellers are ready to step in or maybe short sellers. Um, and then they, you know, sell, sell the stock down. Um, but it makes, a, you know, a lower high here where buyers step back in and they bid it higher. Um, they're not quite able to get it, you know, back above, um, you know, this high. And then, you know, before sellers step back in and, and that process repeats, uh, repeats three times here. It, it can repeat, you know, many more times than that. But, you know, what happens is, this repeats over and over until, you know, this, this battle, this battle between those buyers and sellers um, is, is pretty intense. And, and the stock's not really able to, uh, you know, make much progress to the upside or the downside. And you have this uh, really uh, compressed volatility, right? You have really tight price action around here. Um, and this could have, you know, if you want to draw a trend line across these bottoms, it could have broke to the downside and buyers would have given up and sellers would have, you know, and shorts would have stepped in to, um, you know, bring this thing lower. But what happened is uh, buyers are eventually able to regain control through here. Uh, you can kind of see some of this, you know, green volume increasing and it, you know, increases all the way up uh, through here in this run. Um, but yeah, buyers are able to retake control and they, you know, the sellers sort of, uh, step back and allow the buyers to, uh, run this thing way higher. I mean, it goes from like 40 to 200, um, in, you know, six months or so. Um, so this is an example of a VCP. There are many more examples out there. This might have not been the best example, but it sort of illustrates this, uh, you know, volatility contraction until you get tight price action uh, prior to a move to the upside. So the next type of base I'm going to talk about is the flat base and the square base, um, which are slightly different but very similar in that they are continuation bases or uh, continuation patterns. So these are shorter patterns that follow the, you know, larger uh, base breakout, like the cup and handle or the, you know, double bottom, the VCP, whatever. Um, these continuation bases follow afterwards. And uh, essentially what's happening is it's, you know, that analogy that I think I've used on here before is that, you know, stocks need to squat down before they can jump up. So eventually, you know, they, they've leaped so high and buyers are exhausted that the stock needs to cool off a little bit. And ideally, you would like to see that happen uh, in a, you know, sideways, you know, tight, consolidation. Um, and if you remember in my uh, risk management video, I talked a little bit about how taking profits at 20% is a roughly uh, good place to uh, do so. And that is because continuation patterns tend to form uh, on average once your stock is 20% from uh, that pivot point. So what we'd like to see, so with the square base, which is the shorter of the two, is square base is like a, normally like a three to five week base, um, maybe 5% or so off those highs. Um, and then the flat base is a little bit longer, maybe five to seven weeks 
of, you know, also sideways price action, uh, maybe 5, 10, 15% off those highs. So what we're looking for is sideways price action, um, you know, tight price action before a continued move to the upside. So the continuation pattern uh, just allows the stock to cool off a little bit. It allows, um, you know, sellers to attempt to, um, you know, regain some control, um, can also shake people out, um, you know, create more dry powder for a continued move to the upside. And if you had taken profits at 20% or, you know, around the start of that continuation pattern, the pivot point to maybe buy some more would be a, re a retake of that all-time high as price moves back into new highs. So now if we return to this 2006-2007 uh, Apple double bottom breakout example, um, we can see uh, up here there's a continuation pattern in the form of a, uh, looks like more like a square base uh, to me, but you see this, uh, you know, three, four week consolidation. Uh, it's only about 5% or so off those highs. Um, and it, it's, if you look down, I mean, there's, there's relatively, uh, you know, light selling in here. Um, and this is that idea of continuation. So the, you know, this is a pretty uh, strong run in these weeks prior. Um, prices are a little bit extended from any sort of support level, uh, any sort of uh, moving average. So the stock will just go sideways and consolidate. There's no real selling here. Um, it's just, you know, buyers are a little bit exhausted. Um, and this is a really strong, um, you know, indication that Apple was going to continue this move, uh, which it did before, um, you know, obviously you could see it, it corrected back down here um, and undercut those uh, consolidation levels. Um, and then finally went on this, you know, climactic run uh, into the 2008 market crash. Um, but this is just that example of consolidation and continuation um, that we see. And we're looking for this sideways, pr um, you know, tight price action, um, as you can see here. So now that I've introed relative strength to you and we've discussed some of the most common, um, you know, basing patterns, now we can look at a few more uh, ways to identify relative strength. I think the probably the simplest is using this indicator called the RS line. And what this indicator does is essentially, um, you know, dividing the individual stock price that you're looking at by um, another. So normally it's just the S&P. So for example, you're looking at Apple uh, compared to the S&P 500. And what happens is, is if, let's say, Apple is outperforming the S&P, that, that value is going to be increasing. As, you know, let's say S&P is staying lower and Apple's increasing, you're going to have this increased ratio, uh, which gets plotted onto this line called the RS line. Um, and what this does is it allows you at, you know, a very quick glance to be able to see um, the degree to which a individual stock is uh, performing or, you know, outperforming, underperforming uh, the S&P or whatever index you uh, want to use. Um, and there's, there's two ways primarily that we use this line. Uh, we compare the RS line to price action and we look at the slope of the RS line. So what we'll see a lot of times is as stocks are building out, you know, the right sides of these bases and getting ready for a breakout, um, the strongest ones will have an RS line that's already in new highs. So that RS line will be at the highest value that it's ever been um, prior to price making a new all-time high. Um, and that's generally a signal that pr um, if the RS line is at a high, that's generally a signal that the price action is getting ready to also make a new high. Um, so that can kind of be an early indicator of strong RS uh, you know, relative to the market. And then also we can look at the slope of the RS line, which tells us the degree to which um, that stock is, you know, overperforming or underperforming the market. So if you have a stock that is vastly outperforming the market, um, you'll have an RS line that's pointed, you know, almost straight up or, you know, one o'clock or so. Um, and that's a strong indication of, um, you know, really high RS. Um, then there's also the RS rating, um, which comes alongside this indicator and that's more it's a number and that allows us to quantify exactly how well that stock is performing compared to other stocks so i believe the rs rating starts at 30 and it the max rating is 99 so if you have an rs rating of 99 that would mean that that stock is outperforming 99 percent of other stocks um Generally speaking, for a strong breakout, you would like to see that RS rating be above 70. 
Um, but the best stocks are going to be in, in the 80s or 90s, meaning they're outperforming 80 to 90% of other stocks in the market. Now, this indicator isn't built in uh, to any uh, charting softwares other than uh, MarketSmith, which is a little bit more advanced, a little more expensive. Um, but you can get this indicator for free uh, if you use TradingView. Um, John Mucho has a um, free RS line. You can go to his Twitter to get that. Or I know Trader Lion also has a free RS indicator that I believe you can use on TradingView, TC2000, and Thinkorswim. Um, and none of these people are paying me to say this. It's just a um, matter of fact that they have them for free. And those are the ones that I use uh, and I personally use TradingView. So beyond the RS line, I think it's important to have other ways of identifying RS Um you know, just beyond the line, you never want to just rely on the line because there's a lot of um, other indicators of RS um, that won't show up on an RS line and that are also extremely important. Um, so I've listed a few of them here, uh, the ones that I think are the most important, the ones that I use the most. Um, and the first one would be, you know, stock price making a new all-time high or a new 52-week high. Um, and this is, you know, that stock screaming that, you know, there's something special going on here. Right? There's demand for that stock at a price that's you know the highest it's transacted at, um, you know maybe of all time or in the last year. So that's you know institutional um, you know accumulation of a stock through all-time highs um, is a massive sign of strength, and that's definitely like the, the first uh, and most important one to be looking for. The second could be the distance um, of that stock's price from you know recent highs or recent lows uh, in comparison to the S and P. So if you want to use, you know, today, for example, in this uh, current correction or bear market, if you will, and we're uh, the S&P, we're roughly 19 percent or so off our highs. Um, if you're, you know, most growth stocks will be more volatile than the general market. So if the S&P is 19 percent off its highs, um, you know, most growth tech stocks are going to be, you know, 40, 60, 70 percent off their highs. Um, but if you have a stock that's maybe, you know, 20 percent, 15 percent, 10 percent off their highs, you know, that's a massive sign of strength that that uh, individual name isn't being, um, you know, dumped uh, as aggressively as the general market. And the same goes for the lows. So, you know, like this week, we're seeing this, uh, we've seen this bounce in, in the stock market indexes. So if maybe the, let's say the index is, you know, five, 10% off its lows, but the stock you're looking at is maybe 15, 20% off their lows. Um, that's a sign of strength as well, that it's starting to be accumulated off the lows more aggressively than the general market. Um, another uh, indication of RS would be if that stock is moving sideways while the index is declining. Um, I use I talked about this uh, in the Blockware Intelligence newsletter last week. I uh, highly recommend going and subscribing to that. It's free. Um, but the example that I used, the analogy that I used, was if you think about a stock like a fish swimming in the river, and the current of the river would be the market trend. So if the market's in a downtrend and, you know, the river current is pushing all the fish downstream, um, you'll occasionally see these high RS or these, you know, strong fish that are trying to swim against the current. Um, and what will happen is, you know, that, you know, that fish isn't making any progress, right? That price action is moving sideways while the rest of the market is being pushed down. And then what happens is you have these periods where the market will go sideways, kind of like what we saw, um, you know, last week or two. Or, you know, the market turns around and goes higher and those, you know, really strong fish, those high RS stocks are able to, you know, increase in price, um, you know, much more um, aggressively than the rest of the market. And then there's also um, techniques that we can use using moving averages. Um, and these are some of my favorites. So uh, if you remember in our video last week about crypto equities, I discussed an example of using Bitcoin as your index to uh, judge the relative strength of individual crypto equities. So in that example I used, I looked at uh, Bitcoin in early 2021 um, in that move that it made um, in late 2020, um, you know, through 20K. And we had this uh, consolidation period, this continuation pattern that was formed where Bitcoin pulled back to its 50 day moving average. And, you know, Riot, um, the Bitcoin miner, was able to hold its 21 EMA, its 21-day moving average, 
So this was a sign of strength that it was able to hold a shorter, a faster moving average um, compared to the index. So if you see, you know, the S&P or, you know, for example, let's say it pulled back to its 200 day moving average um, and your stock's able to hold its 50 day or, you know, if it if the index pulls back to the 21 day and your stock's holding the 10 uh, the 10 day, you know, that's a sign of strength. Um, and there's also um, if your moving averages are in the correct order. So you want to see your faster moving averages, your um, you know lower time frame moving averages above those longer term ones. So for example, your your ten your ten days above your twenty one day, which is above your fifty day, which is above your two hundred day, and that's a sign that you know the average price over the last ten days is higher than the average price in the last twenty one days. It's a signal of an uptrend, and what you would you know a sign of strength could be that um, let's say on the index um, that 10 day is now creeping below that 21 day, which is a signal of a short term downtrend. But if your stocks moving averages are able to remain in the correct order, um, that's also a signal of strength in comparison to the index. Um, on my Twitter, um, I have my pin tweet is a thread about relative strength. And I talk about, um, you know, stuff that I've discussed in this video, but I also included a list um, that was made um, by this uh, money manager named Duckman on Twitter, and he compiled this uh, big list of some of the other um, you know key RS indicators. Um, so if you're interested in finding out some more of those, uh, you can head to my Twitter, my pin tweet, and it's uh, right there. So that is all I have for you guys today. I appreciate you. Um, all of you who stuck around to the end, I know this was a longer one. Uh, if you're enjoying this content, um, you know, feel free to leave a like and subscribe to our channel. Um, a few of you guys have been leaving, you know, comments with feedback. I, I really appreciate it. Um, suggestions for things to uh, you'd like to see covered in the future. Hope you all have a great week uh, and come back next week for episode seven. Uh, and thank you for watching.